Uh, and I would also say that it's, it's really humbling to be here with all of you. Um, you know, my position as a cisgendered male uh, American citizen, uh, somebody who's been to elite college. Um, I recognize I was coming down here, I was thinking about the young woman who got body slammed by the cop. Uh, in the school, I think, just maybe three, four hours away from here, and recognize that my experience is not the same as hers, and yet, uh, over the last uh, 15 years, I've tried to act in solidarity and learn from the people who are experiencing this. I know that many of you are fighting for yourselves and for your communities, and so for me to be able to share my learnings, I hope, uh, can add some value and some, some learnings for us to have a deeper conversation together, so I'm really grateful. So, um, you know, Ed, Ed said that we should really come with some new shit, basically, and so I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, let me see what I can do. And so what I wanted to talk about today was the question of what is alternative to capitalism? The big, the big hairy question that I think many of us have been struggling with in different ways. And I obviously do not have an answer to it, but wanted to offer my thinking and some of my own experiences and how I've been grappling with this question. Um, we, I think all of us who are doing this work, who are fighting for jobs, who are fighting against um, homelessness, for example, understand how the system of capitalism in this country connected to a history of white supremacy and patriarchy are the underlying root causes of the injustices and the symptoms that we're trying to fight. And yet at the same time, I feel like as a left, we don't necessarily talk about capitalism explicitly. I've been trying to think about why is that? As someone who gets paid to do social justice work, why did I not have the ability or the language to speak about capitalism in an explicit way? And I believe it's our responsibility. And I also think that it's real, that we don't want to sound crazy right, in the general public. We don't want to alienate the people that we're working with. Folks who are starving want food, not necessarily interested in the question of long-term economic transformation. We also are afraid of alienating funders. But I also think that in some fundamental way, we don't really know what we want. And so for us to talk about an alternative to capitalism or critiquing capitalism is scary if we don't have something to offer to our own communities. And so that, for me, has been one of the driving questions that I've been struggling with over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and so I just want to ask the basic question, you know, if we had all the power as a movement to make any decisions and to create any policies that there's no such thing as a Donald Trump as a front runner in the presidential election and we had the power to wave a wand and create new policies, do we actually know what kind of economy we would want to build? I think that we do understand the fundamental values that Jessica was talking about earlier, but when it comes to the structure of allocation, of pricing, of markets, I don't know that we've necessarily had that conversation in a way that really gives us a collective decision or a collective direction. And so I do believe this, this phrase that I really like, that we have to make the, road by, uh, make the road while walking. But I also think that the proverb that says that if you don't know where you're going, that any road will take you there is also very, very relevant. And so for us, I want to struggle a little bit about the question of where we're trying to go as we also talk about how we, can, how we might be able to get there. So just to situate my own analysis, you know, that I think our vision for what we think is possible is tied to our own personal experiences. And I see myself as an optimistic anti-capitalist. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I believe in the optimism despite the disgusting cruelty that we see every day in the world around us. Um, I think some of it might have to do with my own privilege as a person that I've never really experienced direct violence, that I've never lost uh, loved ones, for example, to the streets. Uh, I have both parents. I grew up in a fairly stable household, and I think in some ways that gave me a foundation. But I know that there are many people who have broad and radical ideas that have not had those same privileges. And so it's more than just my own sheltered from the cruelties of the world, I believe. Um, I think fundamentally, so as a child, my dad was a Buddhist reverend. He talked about the belief that we're all interconnected as human beings, that we don't exist independently of each other. My mom was a piano teacher, and she would save up money every year for us to go to the symphony. And I remember the tears rolling down her eyes as the symphony would crescendo and fill the concert hall. And she taught me about celebrating the capacity and the passion of creativity that we have as human beings. And that, for me, is one of the fundamental things that I seek to hold in the work that we do today. And so uh, I grew up in the West Coast, in the East Bay. Um, I think that I've had the opportunity in some ways to develop a radical analysis because I've seen both sides of America, I believe. I, I existed in, um, I went to public schools in the lowest income school district in Northern California in the Richmond Unified School District. But in elementary school, I went to the wealthiest or highest income elementary school with mostly white and East Asian kids. Uh, then I went to middle school in Richmond and spent the next three years of my life as a 12 through 14 year old walking through metal detectors every, year, uh, every day, um, seeing the experiences that my classmates were going through that were very different from my own. Then I went to high school to also the best high school in the, in the lowest income school district, 
And that didn't mean that there weren't students who weren't making it. The same students that I was friends with in middle school started dropping out, started getting caught up in the system. I think the experiences that many of us have seen or some of you have even experienced yourself. Um, but that also meant that there are privileges and, and resources at the top. And so I was able to take advantage of those and ended up going to Harvard um, and was the only kid in my school, my school district that year who ended up going out to Boston to go to this elite institution. And so it was a really eye-opening experience for me to end up in sort of a bastion of global elitism and privilege. Um, and the first year was great. You know, we, they served us lobster in this like Harry Potter looking dining hall. And I, I'm like, I finally made it, you know. Um, and, and it felt for a year the excitement and the joy that, that I, I, I had experienced. And at the same time, I, I started tutoring in a juvenile detention center. And I, I met a young man named Nick who was just a couple years younger than me. And I knew uh, and I saw his genius, his creativity, his kindness. And I started to think a lot about how he wasn't that much different from my classmates, but the experiences and the opportunities that he received were so fundamentally different. And at the same time, I saw the resources and the privileges that the elite of this world receive in the ways in that allows them to thrive and grow. And so I understood that our experiences, the outcomes that we see, are tied deeply to the structures that we experience. And I think we all know that that's why we're activists in this world. Um, but I also saw that my classmates, and I would say myself also, many were good people, right? that we are young folks who want the same thing as everybody else. We want to find a place in the world. We want to find belonging. We want to find purpose. We want to find love. And I saw the way that the elite institution drove us out of those core values and instead tracked people to become investment bankers and management consultants. But I also saw that it was a structure, right? That it wasn't the people themselves that were necessarily fundamentally evil or greedy, that we were being told to go in this direction, that we were told that our, actually our value we're not us as human beings, but rather our productivity, the role that we can serve in maintaining, well, in my opinion, maintaining global capital and wealth disparities in this country. And so I think my experiencing both sides of the elite and also people who are just struggling and surviving to make it affirmed for me an underlying belief about humanity, which is that we, in fact, can be good, that we, in fact, can be fundamentally generous and that these other things are distorting our characteristics of what it means to be human. And I think this is important because as we talk about what the future of economy could be like, it depends and reflects our beliefs about who we are as humans, right? What our fundamental nature is. And that's what, partly what I want to struggle with today. So I ended up, um, you know, during my college times, uh, starting to work as an organizer and activist around the prison reform movement and had two amazing mentors at the American Friends Service Committee, Jamie and Kazi. One was, came up in the American Indian Movement. The other was a Black Liberation Army uh, alum who spent seven years as a political prisoner. And they taught me about the issue of solitary confinement, which is the first campaign that I started working on. And I learned about solitary confinement, which I believe is a brutal and cruel and torturous system that exists across this country today and that does not get talked about nearly enough. I started asking myself, though, why does solitary confinement have to exist? Why do prisons and mass incarceration exist? And that's what led me to starting to grapple with the question of economics. So we obviously know that prisons are a byproduct or, or represent a way for maintaining white supremacy in this country as we transition from Jim Crow era into the world that we know now. But we also understand prisons as a way of maintaining economic dominance of the current, or of the current class. So in the 70s, we saw that capital became global, that the manufacturing jobs that many young men of color, for example, worked in to help build this country were exported. And for the first time in American history, we had, we had a population of people particularly young men of color, particularly black men, who are no longer economically valuable for this country, that this country found other cheaper labor to exploit in other places. And so as we developed a population that they call surplus populations, we built a prison industrial complex that helped control and maintain order in the streets, right? And at the same time, I saw that that same globalization was destroying economies and free trade zones in other countries, in developing countries, and forcing those people off of their land, having to come across borders illegally into the United States, which then we use the same criminal justice apparatus to criminalize, detain, and deport these people. And so for me, this system of solitary confinement, which was something that anchored the prison system fundamentally, I recognize was also necessarily tied to the system of capitalism and neoliberal globalization that we experience today, right? Yes. And so for me, yes. <laughs> the question became, the question became, well, how do we think about this more broadly? Because I, 
So the first protest that I made, that I, that I did, was as a college student, and it was on solitary confinement. We built a six by eight foot prison cell and plopped it in front of the state house. But it was a particular spring day, um, a cloudy day, and it was actually the first day of shock and, awe, shock and awe, the beginning of the Iraq invasion. And so we had 50 people at my solitary confinement protest, and then down the street at City Hall, there were 3,000, 4,000 people protesting Iraq. And for me, it was such a clarifying day because I started to understand how the prison system clearly was tied to the system of empire militarization, and that for us, the underlying system of capitalism was the thing that was holding a lot of this all together. So three years later, I graduated. I became the executive director of an organization called the Boston Workers Alliance that was organizing under and unemployed workers in Boston, particularly people coming out of prison, people with criminal records. And the next protest that I organized was a 3,000 per person protest, much bigger, where we took the issue of the criminal record system, the ban the box, and in 2007 had 3,000 people take over the streets of, of Massachusetts, of Boston, and help popularize the question of what it means for people to have a right to have a job. And uh, three years later after that, we were able to pass Ban the Box, making us the second state in the country to eliminate that question for all public and private jobs. It was, it was amazing work and, and was really, to me, affirmed the power of communities, the power of people to speak for themselves. It was the folks who were coming out of prison, who devised the policies, who spoke to the legislators, who led the rallies. And that, to me, has always been my fundamental theory of change. And at the same time, we started asking the question, is this enough? Just eliminating barriers to employment wasn't changing the fundamental economics, didn't create more jobs in our communities, wasn't necessarily changing the economic system. And so we started creating worker co-ops. We created a uh, farming co-op that ended up failing, and then we created a recycling business that actually has since uh, gained national attention as a business called Cerro Co-op, which is an organic composting business. And they became famous kind of by raising $340,000 by offering a community direct public offering as a way of capitalizing their business and creating a partial worker-owned and community-owned business. And that's been an amazing story in itself. We also fought for participatory budgeting because we realized that we were fighting issue by issue but needed to build control over the government. And so Boston is now in its third year actually as the first youth-only citywide participatory budgeting process in the country. And that's also been really amazing. I left the Boston Workers Alliance, ended up starting the Boston Impact Initiative, which is an impact investment fund, and I've been able to do investments over the last couple years into the cooperative sector. And yet, I've recognized that that still is not enough in terms of my analysis, or at least for me to feel confident about what we're talking about in terms of long-term alternatives to capitalism. So that's what I want to talk about for the last however many minutes I have. <laughs> okay. So capitalism as an economic system, actually not as old as we think it is, four or five hundred years old, transitioned from feudalism. And so thinking of capitalism as a basic system, or really as any economic system, you need capital, you need land, and you need labor. And these are your inputs into the economy that then allow us to create the things that we consume, right? And so in a, in a capitalist system, we use markets, which means that you're trying to sell high and buy low, and that's what the mechanism that you're using to allocate capital, land, and labor. I think one of the biggest feats of the right wing has been to associate markets with this idea of democracy, that people are going to vote with their money. But I think it's pretty obvious if the 1% owns 90% of the money, then they also own 90% of the votes. And so we need to fundamentally reject this idea that somehow markets are democratic. On the flip side, we have the history of state socialism, right? The Soviet Union, uh, China, for example. And they did not use markets to allocate land, capital, and labor. They used a, a process of centralized state planning. That means that there are people who are saying, this is how much flour we need, how much sugar we need. You have to work over here. And we've seen the critique of that system. One, in that there's a mismatch in the needs of the goods and services, too much flour, not enough sugar. But also the authoritarian nature of central planning in itself allowed for violence and the domination of the state, forcing people to work and forced labor camps where hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives. And so neither of these systems of capitalism or state socialism represent a democratic economy, in my opinion. So then what's the third way? So we're talking about the idea of economic democracy, or that's our own formulation of how to talk about a long-term economic alternative system. So capitalism assumes that you need to have the threat of starvation to get people to work, that you need the threat of competition to get people to be innovative and creative, but we believe fundamentally that that is not true. In fact, there's research that shows that if you take care of people's basic needs, that our own inherent desire for mastery our own creative desires are the ones that drive us to do great things, and it's not necessarily the threat of starvation that we need to hold over people to have a productive economy. And so in economic democracy, we want to take this a step further. 
right? We do need to build cooperatives, for example, but even if every single business in the world was a worker-owned co-op, if we're still operating on a market-based, profit-based system, right, we are still in a race to the bottom and in competition with each other. That's the same dynamics that leads to the environmental degradation, the undercutting of our own labor, for example, right? And so for us, while we do need to democratize the individual models, we are also asking the question of how do we fundamentally change the underlying logic of the economic system. And so I would argue that a new economic system could take from these past two failed systems to build something new and more enlightened, to bring us into the 21st century. First, that we take this idea of planning, central planning, and reject the idea that it should be a top-down, politician-driven process, instead ask the question, what would a democratically planned economy that's planning for our basic needs look like? How do we engage communities to ask, what is the universal standard of living that we all believe that we all deserve? That what is the kind of life and the needs that I want my uh, sister, for example, or my grandfather who can't work anymore? <clears throat> what is the standard of living that we want for them? And part of the debate, this question of what is the conversation that we're in through the democratic process is the higher the standard of living, the more labor that is needed for us as a collective society to meet, right? And that is a trade-off, for example, that do we really think that everybody needs to be able to take uh, a vacation every six months because that means that we need to pay more for planes, we need to pay more for hotels. These are the kinds of things that would increase the labor supply and needs. And so for us, in a similar way, we think about doctors. What's the basic quality of life in terms of health care? Well, the higher quality of life, it might mean the more number of doctors we have, right? But that's the kind of planning and the trade-offs that we want to be asking ourselves as we talk about a democratically planned economy. I also like to equate this to a concept of thinking about family economics. So in a family, I might bring in money, but it doesn't mean that I get to keep all the money, right? I share that with my daughter. I don't have a daughter. I share that with my, <laughs> my, <laughs> my parents, my grandparents, my children, even if they're not necessarily bringing in the productivity because we want to meet the basic needs of all people before spending that money on a vacation or going to pay for baseball um, uniforms or paying for piano lessons, for example. As much as we want those things, people, everybody has to eat first. And so I think that's the logic of democratic planning that prioritizes our labor, but also our ecological resources to meet our initial needs. So then what about the things that we don't need necessarily, but we still want in our society? Well, I do think that we can use markets as an allocation mechanism for that purpose, but in some ways we need some two fundamental, fu fundamentally different things. The first thing is that we need to reconceptualize how capital operates in the private market. So right now, if I have money, I could go start a business and do whatever I want, I would argue in economic democracy, even in a market system, that we eliminate private capital ownership and instead have public ownership of capital, as Jessica was talking about. That you go to a public bank if you have an idea, and you have a panel of community members or even a direct vote by the community to decide if your business plan is a good idea. Instead of coming to someone like me as an individual private investor, which is a job that I do now, and determines who's going to get to have the money to build their own business, right? I also think that we need to think about the role of ecology. So let's say that in our basic democratic planning, we say 80% of our water supply needs to be used for our households, for hospitals, for schools, but there's 20% of the water left. Well, then we can use that water in the market economy where people might say, I want to build a water slide park or I want to create a car wash, right? And these are the ways in which you can allocate and prioritize meeting our basic needs before using the goods and services on these unnecessary or at least luxurious luxurious goods and services. So, you know, I'm not an economist and, excuse me, um, I'm not going to say that these are the answers to the questions, right? There are so many questions around geography, scale, pricing, um, the legal system, um, any number of issues that we've only scratched the surface of. But I do, I do think that um, we're on to something as, as a movement. So. I just, in the last couple minutes, want to talk about the transitional strategy of how we might get from here to there. So I, I consider economic democracy as a subset of a broader new democracy movement that I think Fund for Democratic Communities has been promoting as a rhetorical and political framework, right? That actually we need to democratize our politics, we need to democratize our social institutions, as well as our economic system. And to me, that looks like in the long term, building a long term constitutional reform movement that's fundamentally ending slavery in the 14th Amendment, redefining property rights, establishing a new set of democratic rights that allows us to meet our basic needs, establishes our right to popular planning in the economy. But in the shorter term, right, 
I do think that we can talk about politics at the city level, this idea that local is where we have as communities of color and low-income communities have more power. And so what would a municipal charter or constitutional reform campaign look like in which we're demanding participatory budgeting, establishing community control over police departments, thinking about democratic school boards, these kinds of local democratic reforms that we can use to say, hey, it's not your job to make these decisions, we can do it ourselves. I also think that we need to reconceptualize the role of politicians so that they're no longer decision makers. Instead, their job is to facilitate democratic decision making by the communities ourselves. Second, in terms of social institutions, for us to consider things like restorative justice as a democratic implementation of public safety, where we as communities ourselves can take care and deal with the harms that we create in our own communities, that we don't need to depend on police, for example. And so that's an example of democratizing social institutions in a way that connects with this broader concept of democracy. And then finally, economy. Obviously, we need to be, build more co-ops and land trusts, participatory budgeting, but we also need to start building a democratically governed ecosystem that connects these individual pieces together to model a logic that's fundamentally different from the market economy that we're existing in. And so from that standpoint in Boston, for example, we're building a democratically governed investment vehicle, sort of in the way that Jessica was talking about. We're pulling our own resources, then using political power to get control, for example, of the divest invest capital, and then using participatory budgeting at a neighborhood level to decide what kinds of businesses and real estate projects we want to invest in, right? It's about taking our own collective capital and using that to meet our own needs, not simply to maximize our profits. And so that's just a very initial way that we're thinking about how to prefigure this future economy that we want to build. So in closing, I just want to say that, you know, I think that we have the possibility for creating something new, that every one of us in this room are playing our own role in building this new movement ecosystem. Underlying, I want to remind us this fundamental belief about the capacity and the goodness of people. And I think that ultimately this idea that says we believe in you, right, that we believe in ourselves, is the underlying thing for us to be raising up from a standpoint of values and principles. And so, you know, going back to the question of solitary confinement, I want to ask, are we going to move into a society that maintains solitary, or are we going to build a society that builds solidarity? As Ed was asking, are we moving towards a society that builds freedom, or are we building a society that builds fascism? I believe that we can win, ultimately, because I believe in ourselves.